uh, anatomy of the sentences Another shows file. that um, if well, we have four pairs of sentences or more, some people have up to six pairs. Um, basically, those are the two sets of nose and on the two sides of the top, the tip of the nose to the eyes and in the frontal area of all four touch, as well as behind, behind where it's closer to the ear. So when our sentences are blocked, um, it can create pressure over our head. And so that's the chronic, and that's the rhino uh, sinusitis. And because oftentimes it's a chronic situation, people are suffering for a long time. It doesn't go away by itself. Um, so we call this CRS for chronic rhinosinitis. Although sometimes we just call it sinusitis. Uh, <clears throat> which is an inflammation of the tissue lining in our sinus area. So typically that's in, for example, in this area, the, the rhinal part of the sinuses are blocked. Then they could have um, this area in all the sinuses becomes swollen. And when it's, it gets swollen, fluid will stuck in there, couldn't um, drain out. Then it becomes a uh, bad for bacteria and gets infection. And it's, because it's blocked in this area, it's very hard to clear by itself. So doctors will use medication, try to clear the bacteria, hoping, hoping that the, the tissue, the swollen tissue will come down and it can begin to breathe normally again. But oftentimes that doesn't work. So a surgery will be required to remove some part of the bone or some polyps along the area so we can breathe again. <clears throat> so when I began to work on this project with the ENT doctor, I just knew, okay, this is a condition, but so what? Until one day I went with my daughter, she has been having cold symptoms, stuffy noses repeatedly. And she just said, well, don't worry, mom, I'm young, I'm fine. This is just an, another cold. I said, but you have cold like three or four times over the year. And then when we were in front of the Sephora, you know, the store for makeup, <laughs> she said, Mom, I cannot smell anything. You know, Spa is the most strongest smell in right. <laughs> this store. And she couldn't smell anything. I knew this is not right. She actually lost her smell just from the repeated infections of her sinuses. And I, that, re that reminds me, another friend, a close friend of mine, she and she, she lost her hearing also from the sinuses problem. So this is actually a pretty um, severe condition, despite people think it's just some stuffy nonsense, but it can really affect people's quality of life. The pressure over the head, loss of smell, loss of, um, loss of the, the hearing. Um, <clears throat> so how do we treat it? Um, Okay, here's some statistics. About 5 to 12 percent of the general population are suffering from CRS, chronic rhinosinitis. I'm going to just call CRS because it's worth so hard to pronounce. <laughs> and treatment usually starts with antibiotics. Doctors will try the first line antibiotics, and if it doesn't work, they will use some in, um, intelligible antibiotics to try to penetrate the sinus, uh, the, the, uh, the tip of the sinus, is trying to, try to make it go in. But if that doesn't work, then surgery is the best option for patients. And that surgery is called the endoscopic surgery, ESS. It's an um, endoscopic device with a camera and a, a knife, a blade um, in the tip. So a doctor can see what's going on, can use the blade to remove some the polyps as well as the, some part of the bone. The patient's structure needs to um, remove the bone to make up the room. You can imagine. Like if the nose is like um like a, a room very crowded, it's like it's very hard to find space for the air to go through. So it's like unclouding your nose to open up the space <clears throat> for air to, to breathe through and to have less opportunity to have to develop polyps. Okay. 
Um, <clears throat> so let's focus, look at the subpopulations where the doctors was bring to my attention. These are the Asians and Asian American populations. For these populations, um, one, they are underrepresented in research. Um, we, we typically will have Asians done as a whole group. John Bongi, my PhD student, will know this very well because he's, <coughs> he's working on a uh, qualifying them for looking at this, um, different ethnicity of the Asian population. I think Rona also has the similar interest just to recognize that these ethnic different groups are, are different, but when they are representing research, they are less likely to rep represent in research and less likely to, to, to pay attention to their different differences. So that's one of the reasons that prompted my interest. And, but the clinical reason is that um, based on the doctor's observations, as well as what's reported in the literature, minority has lower acceptance of the surgery or lower, lower access to, to the ESS surgery. And the, the doctor's her, his own practice, his name's Kevin Hurd. His practice found out this for white populations that he's seen, 81% of them are accepting the ESS when it was over. But only 40% of his Asian patients are accepting this. So we want to know why is such a disparity. We believe there's some in because they are seeing the same doctor. They are providing the same information. Why is there still such a disparity? So maybe the decision-making style amongst Asian populations are different. So we want to study that and also try to identify how we can address this disparity. Okay, so we first conducted a, a preliminary study. Of, it's a qualitative study of the surgical hesitancy among Chinese Americans with chronic rhinositis. Um, I interviewed, well, with my, the help of my students, we interviewed um, Chinese American patients who have offered the surgery option because they refractory to the medications. So we want to know um, what are the patterns of the decision making? Are there some specific concerns they have regarding naked decision to move forward with surgery? So we interviewed 22 of um, these Chinese American patients refractory um, to medication treatment for their CIS. And we conducted about one hour semi-structured interview and we analyzed the data. This is what we find. We found um, the demographics of this population are in the middle to older age groups. So um, our average, the, trend, the average age of this population is 53 years old. Um, and those who had surgery, that's 12 of the 22 patients, on average are younger, they are 46 years old. Patients who are still considering, but they are hesitant, are 61.8 years old. For those who already declined, they are not going to do it, are 63.5 years old. So we see older age has more hesitancy or even declining to receive the surgery. Some other differences here. And our analysis were able to show we can see three distinct groups of the patient. We call them optimistic, hesitant, and resistant type of decision makers. So I'm going to illustrate each type of decision makers and later talk about the overall themes we identified for them to be surgical hesitant. So for optimistic patients, they um they are more proactively trying to improve their health conditions. As we talked about earlier, um, for patients who are suffering from a CRS, their quality of life are greatly infect affected. But after surgery, their quality of life greatly improved. It's like uh, from 0.2 point to the quality of life improved to 0.8, 0.9 um, out of the one. Okay. So it's a great improvement. So these patients, they are proactive trying to improve their own health conditions. And so therefore they believe uh, going whatever it takes, they just want to get it improved. <clears throat> so despite their concerns, their fear, they still are willing to move forward. And their attitude is typically like, um, if surgery is needed, it's better to do it sooner than later. And 
um, if even if their family members around them are concerning it, because Chinese seems to be very concerned about surgery, they still think, um, don't worry, it should be fine, no problem, it should be treated. And this includes my daughter, is one of these patients being interviewed. Um, she said, Mom, whatever you say, it's going to improve my situation, I will do it. <laughs> The second type is they are hesitant. They are they, they couldn't move forward, but they are also not declining. Okay. So these patients, they are in a state of indecision regarding whether to take the surgical intervention. But they are open to persuasion. Yeah. They need more information. They want to see other people's successful cases. They want to know all the process that it's going to go through. And so they just need a lot more information to convince them. Um, so one quote is, I have hope that after the surgery is done, there won't be problems like nose please in the morning, right? Okay, so it's uncertain. But I do have a concern that after the surgery, there might be some other effects on the nose or perhaps on how I breathe the air. So they see some benefits, but they're also highly concerned about the uncertainty in outcomes. That's why they are very pleasant. But the third type, resistant to surgery, these are people who have strong beliefs. And in Chinese, some beliefs, for example, we shouldn't have surgery um, because our body was given by our parents. So cutting up ourselves, not good. It's fine, the surgery is actually endoscopic. So it goes, so, no, there's no incision on your face. But the word surgery makes many people um, fear. <laughs> and worried. They also have believed that uh, learning to live with suffering mm. is a good thing. <laughs> we have been taught that if you're able to suffer through, you're going to be successful or above others, right? right. We say in Chinese, mm. So people believe that if suffering is a, is a lesson from from the supernatural, and it's good that you can suffer it through. So with that belief, they say, especially some people are older, they have been suffering through their whole life. They say, why couldn't I just try to relieve a little bit, and I can just keep falling through. Um, it's no big deal. So they are now open to the suggestion that this is likely to improve their quality of life by a lot. They just want to deal with the, the suffering. Okay. <laughs> and we also find six main themes for the factors of hesitancy. Um, for people who have current concurrent health conditions, yeah. they're afraid the surgery is going to um, worsen their health condition. Like people who have heart disease, they're worried um, they, they, their heart may not be able to uh, so, yeah. this surgery. Despite some surgery, some surgery only takes 20 minutes, but it can be go up to three hours. So they are concerning whether their body is able to uh, succeed in, in the surgical situation. Um, <clears throat> some people have bad experiences, so they are worried about uh, their post-surgical recovery. They, their previous experiences may be giving them more trouble in the um, the side effects or the recovery process. So they are very worried about those situations happen to them again. Um, and many people also heard stories of people did not succeed in their surgery and they have regret. So themselves becomes worried that what if that's one, if that's me, what I regret. So they are afraid to move forward to take the surgery. And despite doctors tell patients that there's a significant improvement in the quality of life, patients less likely to consider that as the benefit they will reap. They, they are risk averse, so they are much more worried about the risk than the benefit. So the benefit is like, okay, yes, but it's basically flying through their head, right? and they're just hearing risk, 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 risk. Um, so we know maybe we should be able to help some patients by providing them better information, even by providing them successful cases to balance out the 
uh, the information patient gets. Because many patients, they hear a story that's negative, that register with them much more than they hear positive stories. And people are also less likely to share positive stories than negative stories, that is Chinese culture. So <clears throat> we want to provide more balanced information. How do we do that? So we develop a um, website, web tool to support patients with information and patient stories. And we hope that we can involve patients in this decision support um, by providing the information, providing the way to empower them to ask questions, to discuss their concerns, to vet their values, but also um, open up their mind to accept more balanced information. So that's the patient-centered clinical decision support intervention that we're hoping to develop. And so if you have your phone, Feel free to scan the QR code to try the app that we developed. So you can see there are three languages you can try. I mean, two languages, one is the version of the Chinese language. What are the two versions of the Chinese language? We have two characters in writing. One is traditional, one is simplified. Traditional are the ones that have been used over 2,000 years. But um, since 1957, many China has tried to simplify the writing so people can get educated in their books. This is still a prototype. Um, we are building two more features. So currently, okay, you see that purple plus full condition is describing the conditions of CRS. And then we offer information about treatment. This are information was available from standardshealth.net, but we rewrote it to become um, more easier to read instead of scientific writing. So this is written at um, Grade six reading level. Testimonials, or right now we are changing to patient narratives, are patient stories we learned from interview those 22 patients. The interview just like interview questions. So we send the entire interview script to a um, version of the ChatGPT, more private. And then have the ChatGPT rewrite it to become a patient narrative. And we reviewed for accuracy. And we, the first version is we asked the ChatGPT to write as a, um, a patient um, story, but in third person. But after we read it, we said, this doesn't sound like patient story. So we rewrite, we asked ChatGPT to rewrite it into a first person voice. And that seems to work well. So we, we first, put, if you look at the patient testimonials, which one do you click first, I'm curious. I just click on the first one. Okay, first one. <laughs> we are currently testing this app with patients. We found patients often click the first, the person most re resemble themselves by age or by, by, by gender. <clears throat> We also have a session called frequently asked questions. Again, that's all the information we got from our patient interviews. And we organize them to the timing of receiving surgeries before, during, and after the care. So patients can, can see the processes. I think this address most patients' information needs. But there are about five or less percentage of patients might experience uh, more difficult surgery or even have some complications. So we are building additional features uh, currently under, under construction is to allow patients to ask questions 
um, interact with the doctors more directly. So these are the new features we try to develop in a more patient centric. Um, for your potential interest, this is the infrastructure, the architecture design of our app. So I have one student working the front end, another student working the back end. So the front end is the user interface, the information that we provided, um, how to navigate the website. And the back end are the infrastructure to include how to know what patients are clicking and bring up the pages able to document, to download their clicking history so we can track which page patients search first so we can know what are attracted to patients. Um, <coughs> so we can get some logs for analysis later. But we have to develop the, I know where the databases and host this on um, um, Amazon's AWS. So as mentioned, the key features including providing patient education with information, essentially frequently asked questions, provide patient narratives to support patients to support balanced stories. So not everybody in that patient narratives have decided to do surgery. But most of them did because out of the 22 patients decided to do the surgery. So we have more cases of patients deciding to do the surgery. We also have interviews after they do the surgery so they can reflect how much they have seen real improvement in their quality of life. But we also have patients who are very concerned and we show why they are concerned. So the reason is we want patients to see this balanced information. So if they want to discuss it with, with their doctor, uh, they can say, okay, just like this person, I'm concerned about my complications, that, that, that. Uh, so, and the last one, the patient-centered care component was still building it. Yeah, and for that one, actually, I think in the discussion, I would like to know from our social work perspective, we know we want to meet our clients where they are. Right. We want to be client-centered. Um, we want to incorporate patients or clients' values, preferences. I want to know how to do that in the digital tool. So if you have suggestions, I'm very very happy to take some suggestions to try to build our, our digital tool. That's why this part is still under construction because we are still thinking how we do that. Yes, Jeff. I think maybe something like um, like a, a, a mailbox that they can type in and then they will store somewhere and then later on a team member can answer the question. Right. Like that. Yes, that's that's the current that's the current design. The current, um, yeah, so current design will include um, the six main has hesitancy factors. Um, convert them into question. So patients say, I would like to talk more about my concurrent health concerns. I would like to talk more about why do I have to do the surgery? So these are the information patient can select. And under each selection, they can they can type more or use voice to uh, to to type right because some patients don't like to type. Um, we also allow them to just instead of choosing one of the six options, um, open open discussion with doctor. And the workflow is to send those information to our research account, so we can track what concerns patients have, what they like to talk more about. And have the have Dr. Or her answer in you know, that email account, so we can also track his answer. So those can eventually become frequently asked questions uh, on the website. Oh. Yeah, but Dr. Doctor Ho knows a lot about his patient concern. And when we are building this website, he did not. We we decide not to put all the potential concerns in the website because we don't want to scare patients. <laughs> Patients, it's hard for them to know, okay, this is 95% of the case. This is maybe one to up to 5% of the case. We should make a decision because you present that the patient don't know probability, right? <laughs> so they'll be very, very worried. But we don't also want to ignore their needs. That's why we, we want to separate this into different information and be able to screen that screen appropriately as what well, present as information for educational purposes versus uh, allow a mechanism for them to express their values, concerns, circumstances.
I think you have, if you have other suggestions, um, thank you, and I'd love to hear more. So currently we have, um, we, we, uh, we are developing this as a uh, final study with three themes. Um, it's kind of sort of pattern, not, not, not like full scale towards this is called power, but we also still want to know enough how patients react to this intervention. So currently we are developing this website and then we would like to recruit uh, 15, 15 patients from four clinics that you are seeing held with the ENT clinics and randomized patients. So either they receive usual care, which is information package um, or using the website. And we are going to compare the outcomes because we emphasize patient-centered so the assessment actually is slightly different from just assessing patient health outcomes. We want to assess their decision quality okay. when they are making this decision, how they perceive that they are involved in the decision, shared decision, their concerns being answered. Um, so I see a shared decision making experiences. Whether they, they gain the knowledge to help them make the decision, do they trust the clinicians or in this process of communication? Um, whether they are satisfied with their care and um, do they have improvement in the, in the outcomes. So our research team includes um, the multiple PI because we each bring our expertise um, with research and clinical practices. So that's Dr. Her and me um, leading this project. Um, well, hoping that slide is going to get going with this project. Um, we have, we're going to recruit six patients as our advisory group. So these are the real patients. And currently we have Peyton, our patient student working with us, as well as an MD student, Janelle, and an master student in engineering working with us as a research assistant. And for the technical, technical assistance, uh, we have two, three students from computer science helping us developing the tool. Um, I also would like to acknowledge um, Yixuan and Yinchen who were in our school before for helping with the qualitative study. We didn't make qualitative study, I mentioned this earlier. Um, so we have received some small funding to get this project going, including the number faculty grant that allows us to do qualitative analysis I can present today, and also the qualitative study I mentioned. We also have the funding to hire undergrad students, those that are computer science students are hired to develop this, this plan. Um, okay, so I have no personal disclosure to show, <laughs> except for one of them, the patient was, in, was my daughter. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Suggestions? <laughs> uh, yes, do you have question. Um, thank you for the presentation. I mean, what uh, well, uh, I Oh, great. great. Uh, I didn't know this term before, but as soon as I hear was talking about the CRS, you have one. I've known from my daughter. Oh, no. Um, she hasn't diagnosed yet, but I've been actually very uh -huh. because they were like, not necessarily seasonal. Well, yes. as you mentioned, it's five or six times in a year. Yes. I have to take her to get rid of, you know, all the, the mucus and things. But, you know, so that the right mm -hmm. Is there any suggestion okay. that you have know, surgery? Any information on, on the website? I didn't see any bias. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, and then support the parents. Uh, okay. All right. And that's a great point. We actually have not. Pay attention to pediatric patients because <laughs> that's the first patients are adult patients. But I'm happy to deliver your questions to him. I'm sure he can answer. I know he said that when my daughter was 21 years old, mm -hmm. he, um, he said it's better for people to get a treatment earlier rather than later. But I don't know how early she take for your daughter. She's probably 10 years old. Okay, uh, yeah, I don't know. 
So it would be online here. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. It was uh, really interesting for someone to, to be uh, involved in a study like that. I have a few questions, some of them out of curiosity and some from more of the research perspective. So um, <clears throat> in terms of the disease itself, uh, is there a possibility of spontaneous recovery? In other words, if someone doesn't take their, doesn't do their surgery, is there a possibility? Um, so that's question number two. The second is... Um, in terms of the age of the manifestation, um, is there a typical age and does it get uh, worse over time mm -hmm. with age? And that is related to the age that you're uh, focusing on. Um, I'm curious to know what happened to your daughter. <laughs> and uh, last question, I think. Um, uh, do people change the the perspective over time? So let's say someone says no this year, but they yeah. two years from now they'll say, "Okay, I'm ready." Yes. Um, and the last question is um, from a researcher perspective: Is there a concern that we're creating a website that might push them to do the surgery when they're not ready yet? And that's a social work question, yes, yes. Uh, because we yes. want to help people do what they need to do when they're ready. Right. Uh, and, and particularly with the medical issues, you don't know if there might be research 10 years or five years from now that provides some natural medication and it goes away and you think, oh, I did the surgery and why did I did this, do the surgery? Mm -hmm. So I think that, oh, last one. <laughs> That's right. Um, maybe on the website, if you can, do some animation of the role models so they don't need to read through it, but they can see an animation of the oh, presentation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you so you. much. Actually, the last one would be great yeah. to add to the website. Use an AI generated person to yeah. narrate the story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I love think that. especially for all the people that might yeah. be having. Difficult reading the right, small right, thing. yeah. That's that we, we heard people say, Can you just read for me? Yeah, but I think having this AI generated um, character to narrate the story would be a, a great tool to help patients re reviewing the information. Um, in terms of the clinical condition of CIS, um, for patients who are able to spontaneous recovery, typically they will respond to the first line of treatment of antibiotics treatment. Um, occasionally, if they don't respond to the first line treatment, but they could still respond to the second line treatment of inhaler of the uh, inhaled the antibiotics with special devices that can penetrate through better than medications. But when both failed, third line of treatment is the surgery. And that, in that case, it's I I cannot say hundred percent, but it's very unlikely a patient can 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 be can heal themselves because that's typically they have structural problems there um turbulent find that they need surgery to unclot the, the sinuses yeah um the yes the in and the scotic surgery is the newer treatment options it's it's only available in the like last decade or so less than two decades before that, the treatment methods like the balloon enlargement, um, we just try to enlarge the space, but it doesn't do structural change of your um, sinuses. So it's not as effective. And that's why sometimes patients feel that their lines are thin, are thin by the enlargement, which makes them very sensitive to weather. But if we are able to do surgery this way, uh, by unclogging, remove some of the bones and um, diamonds, it will improve. And would it come back? Yes, it might still come back because our body is still growing different different things. It still might come back. So some patients still need to redo the surgery again. But most most of them um, can. This can last decades. We don't. They still need to observe because the surgery is relatively new, newer. Um, <clears throat> But most patients see significant improvement in their quality of life 
And if there's some clotting, doctor can provide antibiotics that can penetrate much easier now because the space is open. So even if they have infection again, medication will become more effective. And so that can prevent them from another surgery. Um, and my daughter, <laughs> she actually has one of the worst cognitive of her nose. And that's that wrong in the family, not myself, I mean. My husband says that. <laughs> yeah, so she has significantly improved. She has no more infections after that. Um, even if there's a cold, it can clear up much quicker. Just normal person would. Um, I don't think she has ever needed another antibiotics because I don't want her to antibiotics all the time. Right. Right? So um, it was a sick some kind of improvement and was was very happy. We were both very happy about the results and I'm so happy that I was doing this surgery. This this research. <laughs> In terms of presenting the information, actually when Dr. Her approached me, his request was is there a way we can convince patients to just move forward with the surgery? Because he sees patients stopping through and he said it's unnecessary. If they are willing to do the surgery, their quality of life will significantly improve and much faster. They would their smell for some patients if they do a surgery early enough, like my daughter, her smell comes back. It took a while, but her smell comes back. Hearing can come back. Some smell um smell can come back. So it's like um but if you waited for too long, it may not come back when the nerves die. It may not come back. So his idea is it's better to do it earlier than later. There's no benefit to wait. So then you want the patient to know that there's no benefit to wait. Just do it. It's it's safe. It's um many patients in his clinics have insurance to cover for it. Right. So financial concern is not a big concern in his patients. Um this I think most patients actually have this cover this surgery covered. So it's not financial reason. It's even for lower income patients wouldn't be a chance. Sure. Access is probably the main reason, the main concern. Because he's trained with this DSS surgery, but we don't have many doctors who are trained in this surgery. So it's a bias that we are studying with his patients. Many patients don't have this kind of access. Yeah. But I also want him, like, from a social work perspective, I want patients to be able to make the decision when they are ready. But we want them to be more informed so they can make a more informed decision earlier on. So that's where we are trying to present information and present um, cases of different type of patients and allow patients to have this patient-centered component to engage in, in that research. So that's why that's why we designed this way to do social justice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Olivia. So the, thank you so much. It was really interesting to see the, you know, like uh, the intervention aspect and, and everything. My question is related to lots of kind of comment what Mahal said is that question and comment or you know, like a thought to share is that like uh, kind of delivery, the information like written on the thing is uh, it's not quite working for younger folks as well. So maybe like using, uh, since you're using AI, ChatGPT kind of thing, there is AI, you can create a podcast. Yes. So the information can be more like a delivery that way. That might be more appealing to the especially younger ones. Yeah. yeah. They don't want to read this. <laughs> maybe myself too. <laughs> yes. I, 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 I love that. <laughs> Features. And I'm still working with the students to see. It, it, it was a struggle to even build this back end to make it work and to see what front end, what information is needed. But I think we are at a stage where we can begin to develop more user-friendly features, especially using AI to do these user-friendly features. Um, and we are also thinking about um, chatbot. So, so patients don't have to read all the information that they can use the chatbot to um, quickly get, get the information they want. So it requires less less reading. Um, we are the, we we are currently working if we can have our own 
our own trip path, only based on the information we have vetted instead of this general um, church P type app where trip path where information is not vetted. But we have to limit on the source of information. Question. But just really quickly, I think there's some questions. Uh, oh, okay. Is that okay? How and where is this app being presented to potential users and marketed? <laughs> um, it's still a research effort, so it's not for open access yet. <laughs> um, it's so it's in, you cannot download this in like in apps apps in any apps app store. Um, still, we provide the link link for the QR code for patients, and we can keep track of who registered for the account. But the the potential use we think is um, the content and the infrastructure is developed that this can be incorporated into electronic health records, and the workflow will be when patients are seeing the doctor in. In the waiting room, typically they have nothing to do. They just look at their phone. So we can provide this information to patients so they can be very informed before they go in to discuss their condition with the, with the provider. Any other questions? Oh, no, no, I just, there's oh, okay. questions okay. online. And, and so, yeah. Okay. Any other? Oh, can you send a presentation? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Treatment is not as efficacious. Yes, yeah, ChatGPT for condition treatment testimonial or efficacious. Um, we just use ChatGPT only for the testimonials. The information. Oh well, let, let me bring it back. For the conditions and treatment, we did use um ChatGPT to convert the scientific information into sixth grade level information in um in in more like a user friendly. Way. Yeah. So we have the version you see, we don't have the disclaimer yet, but we have the disclaimer currently um, in line to be put out to the website. That's in the about page. We say we describe that should be is used. Mm -hmm. So there's a disclaimer for, for all the use of the GBT. For the FAQ, um, FAQ we um, look through patients' information. Um, about their concerns, about the common common things they they mentioned, and summarize that each I think twelve questions according to the timeline. So it was the research assistant who did that step first, and they have ChatGPT translate the language. So most of the translation are ChatGPT translate first, and we exam. Well. Um, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. I think this will have to be our last question, and then we'll, we'll wrap up and people can stick around if they want to talk. Mm -hmm. Professor Weller, I learned a lot from your presentation. One impressive topic was, uh, was actually when you mentioned that there are three subgroups of your patients, like they, you classify them by the risk of version level. Uh, I first I thought very weird why there are some like resist why there were some resistant patients, but when you're talking about when we were talking about the uh, suffering culture actually resonant resonate a lot. I, like for a long time ago, like my motto was like when my, my motto was like uh, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. It's from actually from a Japanese book, and I oh I suddenly learned oh realized oh it's a very it's very important to analyze people's behavior by their, uh, like based on their okay. specific culture, specific yes. reasons, and uh, also somehow religions, something like that. Yes. So I have a question, like, how did you like determine that you want to use these characteristics, like these characteristics, I mean, the, the, the risk of worship level to classify your patients? Mm -hmm. How did you find out this uh, characteristic? Okay. Thank you. So this is touching on the qualitative analysis, which is, is um, the creative process. So we first set out to identify themes for, uh, for hesitancy. But when we are analyzing the themes, it's, it becomes obvious that they are different type of decision makers. And that's why we came up with this categorization. And we have another um, coder to also categorize independently. So we actually found the correct the, the um, interrater reliability between the two raters of this category was 
about point eight, I think it's close to point nine. Oh. So it's very obvious. You can see different type of decision oh. makers. Oh. Yeah. So I would I would say if it's if, if you're thinking of having patient centered decision making, right? That's mm -hmm. what you're embracing as a social justice approach, etc. Yeah. If you have the older population who are the most likely to not want to have this procedure procedure done on and they've lived their lives right. up to now mm -hmm. navigating their experiences despite this issue. Couldn't you argue that they've already made that decision about whether they do want to have this procedure or not? Mm -hmm. um, when they come to a doctor, her, typically they do suffer. Uh, they have seen a doctor. Um, and their body may be able to clear up a little bit um, over time, and that's what they have been able to uh, accomplish to suffering through. Yeah. But when they are getting older, it's less than less their body will be able to clear up. So they are actually a very good candidate for the surgery. But because they have the experiences of suffering through, so they are still thinking that maybe just time just prescribe me medications, I will be able to suffer through. But that's how people sometimes lose their hearing and they think mm -hmm. just aging, or they lose their smell, or lose their um, yeah, taste, and they think it's just aging, and it's not. It could be reversed. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, let's all thank Dr. Wu for a little bit. We'll to just kind of behind the scenes of intervention and development and to hear you wrestle with the, uh, the social work and social justice ethics issues as well as the technology. So thank you very much.